you know, with new and innovative work, it's a hearts and minds process. It's not, you know, it's not always straight up uh, advertising. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I will be speaking with Cova Vice President Dan Sullivan, who is part of the AIA and is a licensed architect. Dan has never really practiced traditional architecture and has set out to develop circularity-driven building solutions to enhance building performance and longevity from the inside out. He has a very impressive CV. He was previously the head of design at Google's Architecture and Research and Design Lab. Um, he's been an architect in the traditional sense at Preston Scott Cohen. He's got his master's in architecture from Harvard, and before that, he was studying at Berkeley. As head of design for Google Architecture's Research and Design Lab, Dan discovered his passion for building solutions that lend to a healthier built environment, enhance end user outcomes and improve neuro aesthetics. It was through his professional experience that he realized just how wasteful architecture and construction can be, and he has set out to remedy this conundrum. At Cova, he is constantly challenging the status quo whilst addressing climate change, the psychology of space, and the material waste produced by the industry. In this episode, Dan and I will be discussing the emergence of new collaborative business models, closing the gap between construction, product, software, and design. We discuss how Cova operates across these numerous domains, and we look at research labs like Skunk Works and the Google Architecture Research and Design Labs and the importance of play and experimentation within business. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Dan Sullivan. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Dan, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Thanks, Ryan. I'm great. I'm great. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Brilliant. Good to good to have you here on the show. I know that we had a we had a few attempts previously, and it's very good to have you here. And I know that you're you're in a, a, a newly renovated home. Is that correct? Yeah, we uh, we bought a house in San Francisco and uh, spent the last eighteen months uh, renovating it. So it's been it's been, you know, as an architect, I think your dream is to to renovate your own home or design your own home, and certainly lived up to certain aspects of that, and 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 also confronted those assumptions in other ways. So it was, uh, but it was a lot of fun. We had we had fun doing Good. it. So. Excellent. Good. So you're the vice president of Cova. Um, previously, you were head of design at uh, at Google's architecture research and design lab. You've worked as an architect. You got your master's degree from Harvard. Prior to that, you were at Berkeley. Um, you've worked in various practices as an architect. It's it's an impressive CV and a very fascinating kind of uh, career evolution if you like, with your current role and the work that you're doing at Cova. Um, I know, I also know that you're a, you're a fan of Burning Man. This is one of your things that you go to. I, I speak to a lot of business people who are big Burning Man fans, um, just for the whole culture of it, the way that opens up your mind and has you thinking about a different kind of, a, a different kind of society or a different way of bartering and doing business. So, very excited to be speaking to you. And I guess the first question is then, what is Cova? How would you describe it? Yeah, so Cova is a uh, buildings, uh, building materials company that sits within a constellation of uh, five companies that together form uh, a, a vertically integrated uh, construction consortium. So within that consortium, we have uh, a uh, residential house builder, we have a uh, a renovations group which uh, acts as an internal GC. Uh, we have uh, a a company doing um, uh, single family rentals. Uh, we have a software company that's providing software as the basis for tying all of this together. 
um, and we have uh, us, the, the building materials company. So, uh, this, you know, the, the consortium together is is really trying to challenge the status quo when it comes to uh, how things are built and how quickly they're built and how cheaply they're built and um, how uh, building can be, um, you know, non-depleting when it comes to natural resources. Um, and so what we're doing is uh, we're sourcing and designing and manufacturing uh, materials to, to, you know, sit within that ecosystem for, uh, for, you know, for internal revenue. And then we're also selling to third party outside of that. So um, what's nice about this from the perspective of someone who's engaged in innovation and research and development is that we have um, sort of a captive test bed for all of the work that we're testing. And what that really enables for uh, us to do um, is to take, uh, you know, greater risks when we're innovating a particular product. Um, We don't need to convince the GC um, or the developer to, to use the product or to, you know, to take a risk on, on the unknown, we get to test it on ourselves um, Mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, push those products out into the, the world at large. So how did you get into this position with, with Cova? Was it, I understand that it, it, you, you purchased the company rather than being the, the founder of it in this particular scenario. Is that correct? Uh, well, this, this company is in its, uh, in its second iteration, uh, right. as, uh, as a materials company. Um, y- you know, really we, uh, what we acquired was an evolved brand, uh, and then, mm-hmm. um, uh, layered our ethos on top of that brand uh, to to make it what it is today and and what it's becoming. But you know, my path to Kova has, I mean, it's really been quite a meandering path, as you know, you sort of mentioned in the intro. Um, I, you know, I am I am an architect, um, and I have, uh, I guess you could say, I've sort of practiced traditional architecture but that traditional architecture was you know was really it was museums and libraries that were you know really um yeah geometrically interesting or or programmatically interesting so you know challenging the status quo of of you know what a building looks like or how we move through space um so you know so even in my traditional practice, it's, you know, it's always been, there's always been a desire to be innovative or experimental or, you know, to figure out a way to, to push beyond the status quo um, in architecture. Um, I think, you know, there was something really satisfying about that work, but there was also something, you know, dissatisfying and, you know, in, in, in terms of the fact that it was, you know, still really wasteful work, uh, still dangerous work for the, you know, for the people on site. Um, and, you know, I think I've just really always been tracking to wanting to have the greatest impact. So um, in leaving that practice, what I really started to seek was um, uh, companies and entities that were you know, that thought the same way that I did, um, that we actually yeah. can do things differently, that we have the, you know, intellectual capacity within the industry to to change it. And so that's uh, when I landed at the R&D lab uh, at Google, um, which was just such a great place. I think, you know, the, the, the impetus behind even forming the lab in the first place was like, you know, hey, uh, we historically... Um, have really been good at being like the world's best hermit crab, right? We've uh, um, found all these old uh, office park buildings, um, renovated the interiors to make them really interesting. And, you know, now as we move into um, building buildings from the ground up, um, how do we, how do we treat innovating in the built environment the same way that we treat innovating around a particular piece of hardware around a particular um, process. And so really the remit for the R and D lab was to, you know, was to take that, that experimental, um, uh, innovative approach and apply it to the portfolio at Google. And there was really just some wonderful work that, that came out of that and, you know, wonderful partnerships that I still, um, cherish to today. 
Um, one of those partnerships mm. actually being what brought me to Cova. Uh, um, my business partner in this, uh, Ken Genter, um, and I had, uh, in his previous life, uh, in my previous life, had had uh, worked together on some of these innovation products, and uh, and really saw an opportunity for for us to take you know, what we've been working on and, and some of these, some of these ideas. And I think also take the confidence, um, that there were, you know, there's big money behind, uh, you yeah. know, this, uh, this approach and people who really value these sorts of innovations and bring them to the, you know, to the industry at large. Um, I mean, it was, so, yeah. So, so when you were at Google, what, what was the nature of the work that you were doing there? I mean, I find it fascinating that they have this research and design lab at all and that, that it has like an, well, I mean, in the domain of architecture and I understand it in software. I think it's amazing that somewhere like a, a place like that is, has a place to play, if you like. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, in a, in a practical sense, the portfolio is enormous. It's so it's large enough mm-hmm. that you know that small innovations can actually have a pretty big impact when it comes to reducing cost. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, reducing the time of construction. Uh, you know, keeping uh, keeping butts in seats longer and not taking space uh, offline. There's you know a lot of really practical reasons. And I think. You know, there's also an evolving ethos across the tech industry at large that um, spaces should be desirable. Um, that you know, especially now, right in the world of like the post 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 COVID world, um, yeah, uh, that there is that people are not being forced to come into the office for arbitrary reasons anymore, and so the office you know needs to become a place where um, people want to go where they want to go for the amenities. Mm-hmm. They want to go for the collaboration. They want to go for, um, you know, the feeling of culture and, and community. And so, um, so yeah, so I think there's, you know, there's both practical reasons, uh, financial time, the, you know, uh, operations and facilities. And then there's also, um, you know, you know, so the, the more human side, which by the way, is also the practical side because you know happier sure. employees are more more productive. They're more creative. They they produce better work. Um, is, is it a space where there that lab is also collaborating with a lot of other outside architects? Because I mean, I know that Google will often you know they they have framework agreements like lots of these large tech companies where you know you have a you know you have a whole group of architects who are who are kind of pre-selected, if you like, to bid for certain pieces of work. Because that, that must be quite fascinating in itself, I would imagine, of being able to be in-house as an architect. And also there might be external input and consultants from other design groups. Sure. Liaising with you. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, like anybody else, uh, we all realize that we can't do this work by ourselves that this, you know, Mm -hmm. that, that really innovating at the scale takes the biggest minds, uh, all working together. And so, so yeah, I think, I mean, and even, uh, you know, certainly collaboration was one of the focuses of our work there. And, and today that's also the name of the game. Um, you know, really we're all trying to find, um, you know, the, the path to low impact, impact resource conscious human centered um architecture and uh Mm -hmm. and know that and also find the profitable path to that and know that it's going to take all of us to get there yeah so so what was the 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 kind of thing that had you move out of well well to kind of move the comfort of a wonderful job in, in an exciting tech company and start your own show yeah um it really it comes back to impact. I, I think uh, mm-hmm. the idea that these idea the idea that these ideas this you know this this path to innovation could be um, exported to a much larger audience is just really seductive to me. Um, you know, of course, the pro- the problems are much more challenging, right? Because when you're when you're innovating for a, a particular uh, 
customer with a particular um, point of view and a particular ethos, um, the solution sets are a little bit narrower, I would say, than when you're really trying to export ideas to, you know, the, the diversity of things that happen out in, in the world. So I'm pointing out my, my window to the tech offices that I can see in downtown San Francisco. So, um, you know, who all, who all come to the table with, you know, different ideas of the world they want to see. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's impact. And also a challenge. I just, I just love a challenge. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, like we all do, right. I mean, let's, let's keep moving onward and upward. So. So the, so Cover itself is is kind of associated with these other types of businesses, d- development, software, renovations, architecture, and then kind of material products mm-hmm. itself. Um, and so, can you can you walk us through some of the projects that you've been involved in, so that so that it helps um, kind of build a picture of how all these different pieces are actually interacting with each other and. And how it works and you can give us a sense of the, the kind of scale of the operation as well sure yeah i mean maybe the maybe the better place to start is just to sort of talk about what what the products are um and sure. and, and what categories they fit into um so our our products fit into three categories uh they fit into um well, actually we're we're gaining categories all the time but high, but highest level uh we have a, a category called uh cobra connect uh, sorry uh cobra construct um, which is really mm-hmm. exterior uh, facade of the building. So that's um, both okay. glazed and opaque facade. Um, products would include uh, window wall, um, curtain wall, um, metal panel. Um, then there's a product called Connect, uh, and that is really the that's the interior of the building. So that you know, that's really targeting offsite construction, um, modularity reconfigurability so things like modular walls modular conference rooms uh interior storefront that's actually a category that we're really working on growing right now um Mm -hmm. just because the you know demolition of the interior of the building uh happens really frequently and is one of the biggest contributors to construction waste um and then we have a a category that we call uh coba components and these are um, smaller components, things like um, uh, faucets, lighting, um, whiteboards. I mean, basically the, anything that we can either uh, design or um, source um, at you know reasonable prices, high quality. Um, this is a, a category of things that um, you know frequently in the building process will get sourced from you know, a vast number of suppliers. And what we endeavor to do is to say, um, look, let's just streamline the process for you. We can put together a package of basically all of your um, interior uh, pieces. Um, And then you Mm -hmm. only have to pay one vendor and, uh, and, you know, coordinate with, you know, one small group of people. Um, And by the way, if you desire to have interior reconfigurability, you know, for your floor plate, we also have a product for that. And if you, you know, want a uh, fully recyclable, uh, you know, demountable facade, um, we also can provide that. So, you know, each of these things, you know, each of those categories can be uh, entry points to, to working with a particular customer. And really, they all, they all fit together, you know, to you know, kind of flesh out the story of, um, uh, you know, resource conscious, um, building products. Yeah. Uh, Um, so, so so with the kind of component side of things, are these, are the components things that you're actually manufacturing yourself or these things that you're actually sourcing and then acting as a kind of a a wholesaler or if you like to, to, of, of those sorts of products for a, for a particular project and then the connect and the construct those are things that you guys actually make yourself yeah so the um the on the component side it it could be that we that we make and uh, that we design and manufacture them it could be that we sure. okay. that, that, that we source them. and what that really depends on is i mean every time we d- decide to take on a product we go through a pretty 
uh, you know, rigorous evaluation process. Um, does the supply chain make sense? Uh, you know, should, mm-hmm. should we be, can, can we win in this space? Um, is it, uh, when we're deciding whether to design something, manufacture ourselves versus source it, you know, we're saying, has someone already done this well? And is this person willing to, you know, does this person share our ethos and are they willing, you know, to partner with us on kind of bringing this, um, you know, this style of product to, uh, to the market. Um, and then yes, when it comes to the, the connect products and the construct products, uh, those are designed and manufactured by us. Got it. Okay. And so there's actually quite a, quite a bit of, um, you know, that you were saying modularity involved in some of the internal components. Um, so how, so how did, what does a relationship look like, for example, with an architect, and how how does the how would the building team kind of emerge, and where would your role be in all of that? That's a great question. It really depends on what product category we're you know we're talking about because I think you know a lot of uh, you know uh, the products that would fit into the components category can be sourced mm-hmm. you know pretty late in the process. Um, so yep. you know drawings are done, permits are issued. Uh, you know, it could be that we, you know, enter, uh, you know, somewhere late in the construction process, someone actually has components coming in rather expensive with too many vendors, you know, we can come in and offer them, uh, uh, you know, single, single source of truth and, uh, and, you know, better pricing and quality. So in that case, the typical interaction would be with the, the GC, um, you know, of course the, the approvals would go back to the architect and, and to the owner. Um, but when it comes to the facade components, um, obviously those are a little bit longer, uh, time horizon. Um, those, uh, in most cases would need to be designed in, in some cases, uh, can be revved in, um, meaning Mm -hmm. the facade is already designed and, and approved. Um, but, uh, but in a revision, our product is substituted for, for one reason or another. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the the connect products, the interior, um, you know, this is a, this is an area where, you know, we were seeking partnership with, with architects. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and actually not just architects, but also developers who have, who have, uh, uh, internal design teams, um, which a lot of, a lot of people do now. Um, but with the connect products, you know, there really is a process you're buying a product, uh, you're buying, you know, individual wall panels with, you know, all the accoutrement, you know, necessary to, yeah. to make rooms. Um, but you're also investing in a way of thinking about the interior of the building, right? So rather than thinking about walls as, you know, things that get built on site and then when they don't serve you anymore, you demo them, you put them in the landfill um, it's really thinking about walls as, um, you know, longer term uh, assets that, that you can reconfigure and, uh, you know, recycle if necessary, move to another building. Um, and that really does, oh, wow. re- you know, uh, re- require a little bit of forethought. I mean, we have, we have mechanisms for being able to enter at basically any part of the process, but if you're really thinking yeah. about, you know, your floor plate and long-term reconfigurability, it's, it's a front ended process, you know? So, you know, buildings will have, um, structural grids that have a particular dimension. They'll have, you know, yeah. um, particularities in terms of like what the slab makeup is or, you know, where the mechanical is or, you know, where, you know, uh, I mean, any, any, any number of things. So thinking about how you, tee yourself up to have a great day one solution, which, you know, addresses all the particularities of, of, uh, of that building. And then also T and then also you have a great, uh, you know, you have like, you know, an, an, an open field of options for your day two solutions. Um, it takes, it takes a little bit of thinking, but actually one thing, Ryan, that's really great is that, that we're working on right now is um, we have um, a, a product that we're working called uh, that we're working on called uh, 
Kova configure. And that is, you know, really the the software aspect of, of what we're doing, which is super interesting to me as an architect. I think, you know, for from, you know, undergrad and grad school and throughout my whole career and, you know, sort of our collective whole careers, you know, we've, we've envisioned this future where computers, uh, you know, help. We, we've, we've envisioned and also maybe feared the, the future uh, where <laughs> computers are able to help architects. Um, but these, these configure products are, are really great. So the exterior configurator is able to um, uh, sort of discern design intent uh, at the exterior of the building um, and then based on, you know, a number of efficiency parameters is able to actually give a, you know, mullion layout, glass sizes, uh, et cetera. And the one for the interiors, uh, is much, I mean, that the exterior is very complicated. The interior is like exceptionally complicated. Um, but, yeah. uh, but, you know, being able to basically read a, a plan given by, uh, an architect, modularize that plan, and then also think through the scenarios that I was talking about, like how to actually um, enable a, you know, real day two breadth of options. It, it, it's quite fascinating because it's, it's quite a versatile suite of offerings that you've got. And in many ways you could imagine that there could be, you know, that what you're doing is kind of occupying multiple domains at once like from from design and the architects to actually you know product manufacturer also to construction and, and, and installation of the of these certain types of products how and and, and what's very interesting at the moment is we're starting to see a quite a big shift in the way that contemporary buildings are procured um, with the advancements in pre, you know, digital manufacture and offsite construction, and and a way of kind of being able to bring designers closer to the 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 end product. Um, how does your how does your kind of suite of offerings, if you like, um, how how is it looking to kind of alter, or how how is it how is it solving various procurement problems? If you like, uh, yeah. First, let me just ask. So, say more about what you're observing, because uh, I'm 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 curious just to sort of add more context to the to the question. So, so I've I've interviewed a number of clients, not clients, but a number of architects recently, and a number of uh, kind of contractors who are you know there's been a number of modular constructors who are working very closely with architects and they've got a kind of, you know, volumetric solution to the point where, you know, one was just joking with me the other day that there's, there's the possibility in the future that people have moved into their apartments before it's actually been put on site. And I thought that was, as a notion was wonderful. Like this idea that you can actually move into an apartment that's on a, that's in a, in a factory somewhere and be quite comfortable living in the yard. And then it gets kind of transported in and put on, Put, put into site and then we're starting to see architects use technologies which have been adopted from say aeronautical engineering where there is this kind of much more closer relationship between the 3d modeling and then actually what is created for manufacturing and we're starting to see this kind of shortening of the of the construction process where you can have designer who's then creating from sketch initial ideas and then being able to produce very detailed information that can go straight to a manufacturer, be produced, and then it's it's more like an assembly of parts and, you know, it's kind of, it, it, it's shortening the process and making it very, very effective and very efficient. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think everyone, I mean, this is, you know, my opinion, but everyone is really trying to understand how to leverage architecture, uh, leverage uh, technology within architecture and construction yeah. to to make it, you know, to just make it lower risk. And what that means is mm -hmm. like, you know, lowering cost, shortening time, making it more safe. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, I mean, the, you know, certainly it's it's in it's in the zeitgeist at, at this point and. And uh, so hopefully more people actually, you know, are, are, are out there doing these things. So 
tell me a little bit about the so the other the other parts of the 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 group. So how like for example, how do you what, what's what kind of advancements or relationships do you have with with software? And is this something that where you're kind of producing your own software so people could actually, you know, not necessarily architects, but anybody like a developer could be doing their own design if you like or they could design or they could take a facade design by themselves using software to a certain point and then it becomes manufactured yeah i mean i think that brings up a really interesting question of what's proprietary uh you know within within the software realm um Mm -hmm. and what's actually uh you know what's most valuable um you know and i think uh, the software itself, meaning like the the base sort of like machine that can actually host these um, algorithms is certainly um, an area to to innovate in. And that's, you know, really where our software group is, is innovating um, in terms of, uh, you know, being able to um, internalize data, collect insights, um, uh, you know, provide feedback essentially you know augment decision making within the design and construction process and then there's the question of um the algorithm which in my mind is you know the scaling of the um the you know the 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 thinking um and so when you think about how you differentiate a company within the context of you know the digital, um, how we actually optimize a facade becomes really important and proprietary. How does it actually internalize, you know, how does it understand design intent? You know, what are mm-hmm. like, what are the keys when we're doing an analysis of a facade? What are the, what are the keys that we are programming into the algorithm for it to look at, um, for it to really understand why emollient is in a particular place is it you know a, a particular alignment is it driven by um you know some code requirement is it driven by um a glass sizing requirement um you know and then you know based on our own manufacturing processes there will be um you know different optimizations right there'll be some max min for length and width there'll be some overall uh, area max min for you know for these panels um how it actually translates those things to shop drawings what those shop drawings look like what uh, pieces of information are actually critical to you know to us for shop drawings i think these things are really all proprietary so the idea is this becomes support for for us um you know ways of scaling our own thinking and sure uh, you know, we could actually export that algorithm to somebody else and they may find it valuable or they may, they may not find it valuable. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, certainly an algorithm can become a, a commodity. Um, it can be, you yeah. know, it can be protectable from an IP perspective, um, et cetera. Um, but whether, whether or not the industry as a whole decides to coalesce around a finite number of, algorithms related to design, I think is a big question. Um, you know, we're not the only ones working on uh, configurators. I think, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking back, as I said, to like, you know, grad school where uh, colleagues were, you know, trying to figure out, you know, even just site planning, you know, using uh, sun angles and, and uh, you know, height and bulk limits from a, from a planning perspective to, you know, create building massing. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, really interesting to me is this idea that like, you know, at some point, uh, many of the more mechanical aspects of what the architect does c- can be turned into algorithms, can can actually be um, quantified. Um, but then my question is like, what happens after that? Like, what does that actually free us up to do like when like then what does the architect use his or her brain to do uh and the, I mean, the answer is like all the rest of the things like so much more like couldn't the construction industry be s- so much more so much you know so much uh, you know more environmental couldn't it be mm-hmm. potentially like so much more profitable um is it so much better for for human beings 
Um, so I, that's, that's one thing that's just like, that is just really interesting to me is, you know, like the, the scaling of the human brain in this process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from a, from a business perspective, then how do you typically cultivate new work and new relationships? How do, how do people, you know, how, how are people finding out about you? How do you, are you, are you kind of specifically looking for certain architects to be working with or certain projects to be involved in? Um, yeah, I mean, some new relationships or old relationships that, you know, we have a, a fair number of, uh, of people in the company that actually, um, you know, I've worked in the industry for a long time, myself included, who have, mm-hmm. you know, built, um, tr- trusting relationships. So, uh, so certainly relationship building is personal. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, uh, we have, you know, a, pretty robust, um, brand building, uh, strategy, um, internally. And, um, but I think, you know, it's also, it's also, I think, you know, podcasts just like this, Ryan, like, you know, having an opportunity to just talk about a vision for the world and then see who that resonates with. Like, you know, I don't know, someone listening to this at some point might say, ah, you know, I, I, I've been, you know, looking for, you know, for just, you know, this thing, whatever, you know, whatever that thing is, whatever that person's like little corner of, of improvement in the built environment is. So, um, you know, with new and innovative work, it's a, it's a hearts and minds, um, process. It's not, you know, it's not always straight up uh, advertising. Yeah. How were the, the kind of components and the products that you have, how, how did they begin life? Um, what, what, do, what do you mean by that? Like, where did they, where did they come from? How were they developed? How did they get refined? Got it. Yeah. Um, so Cause it, because, because that, in, that in itself is requires, a, it can be quite an intensive, you know, quite a capital intensive process. Yeah. I mean, or not. <laughs> we have a, we have a pretty s- scrappy, uh, research and product development, uh, department we have a a really experienced team of people who know how to do a lot with with very little Mm -hmm. resources or with i I won't say very little resources very generous resources but but actually turn those into you know exponential uh impact um sure but we do have a a research and development lab Uh, it's actually based here in the bay area Uh, it's uh, down by the san francisco airport in a an industrial park um, you know, a perfect cover for our, uh, our, our covert skunk works, um, which, which always feels real nice. <laughs> uh, and, and in that space, uh, we have a team of people who are, we have researchers, uh, we have, uh, designers, we've got uh, product managers. Um, we have, uh, a, uh, we have GCs uh, or subs in there. We have, uh, you know, contractors working all the time. We have, uh, prototypes. We have uh, an acoustic test chamber for being able to to test materials. We have acoustic test equipment that's mobile that we can actually you know test our our you know interior products with. I mean, it's really it's a it's a place of. I mean, it's I just love it. It's so exciting. It's uh, you know it just feels like creative energy all the time. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, it's just full of stuff. Like there's, it's like, you know, um, it's, it's like the, you know, the architecture studio, right. It's like there are models and, and they're like half made pieces of something that felt like a great idea. And it turned out that it was a terrible idea and, uh, you know, rooms that, um, that, you know, are actually the, you know, agglomeration of, of these ideas of Frankenstein together. We have ones that are, you know, more refined. It's, uh, it's just, it's really an exciting place. And so that actually forms the, I mean, that's really, you know, to kind of play on your metaphor of where things are born. Um, I mean, that's, you know, the, the I guess the, uh, the, the, this is a, the the fertility lab i guess and then you know the like 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 the neonatal icu unit i don't know it's uh 
it's you know it's, it's i like it i like it's it sort of all those things um but we have we have we have a lot of fun we we do a lot of really hard work uh we you mm-hmm. know we produce a lot of things that are that don't land in products that actually just uh you know uh, turn into uh patent filings for use later um you know i i mean i think one of the things about you know sort of the the future thinking within this industry is that you never really know when an idea is going to be ready and a lot of times um your ideas are you know five years ten years too soon like the processes for manufacturing these things just don't work yet or or don't exist yet and the you know the financials don't work out yet because of you know uh, industry-wide adoption etc so the um uh so a lot gets a lot gets shelved um you know for every good idea there's hundreds of bad ideas so we we spoke briefly uh, last time we we touched base around this idea of neuro aesthetics mm-hmm. what is that yeah neuro aesthetics is really interesting and um you know it's it's uh when you begin to really look at human beings in space uh, the topic of neuroaesthetics inevitably um, comes up. It's something that's, you know, mm-hmm. sort of, you know, in the parlance of like what's happening in, with architects and, and also what's happening sort of in the, um, in the tech industry. But, you know, it's, I think neuroaesthetics, by the way, I didn't study neuroaesthetics. I just have worked with a lot of people who have studied neuroaesthetics and, you know, learned sort of the basic tenets of the process in a, in a way to be able to, um, you know, at least knowledgeably, you know, uh, insert them into our products and processes. Um, but it's the idea that science can, to a certain degree, predict human response to certain environmental conditions. Um, so whether that's, you know, the amount of light in the space, the mm-hmm. temperature of light in the space, um, acoustic conditions, uh, like, um, you know, ambient noise, uh, you know, you hear a lot about brown noise these days. I probably read, you know, 10 articles in the past, uh, you know, six months about brown noise helping with ADD, but also helping, you know, those of us who love to hyper-focus at, at some points. Um, um, but yeah, it's basically, it, 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 it incorporates, um, psychology, um, neuroscience, you know, sort of a, a bunch of other uh, humanities disciplines and sort of attempts to make um, scientific sense of, of our response. And, you know, and so, whether, yeah. you know, whether that's really about like, um, you know, neurotransmitter uh, um, impacts on the body, um, there's, there's, I, th- I think there's quite a bit there. It's really, it's really rich area um, to explore. And I'm, I, I guess I'm just really excited to see how, how it develops, um, and how, how owners, how building owners, how, you know, I mean, I keep going back to tech office cause that's, you know, my, my background, but how, yeah how this actually becomes, you know, sort of table stakes, uh, for, for design going forward, uh, or mm. an opportunity for differentiation. You know, if you have a scientific secret <laughs> to make your spaces, you know, more amenable to focus or, or just make them more productive, that's, that's, a, that's a real differentiator. You know, I think there's, there's a desire, I think, to – maybe this is just like a natural human desire to, to, to come up with a pattern language for neuroaesthetics – um, you know, yeah. like a do this, don't do that. It's this color, not that color. It's this light temperature, not that. It's this temperature of space, you know, this temperature of, of ambient air. It's, you know, this visual connection. Um, you know, it's, it's this level of plushness in a material. Um, but it's not. It's, uh, you know, yeah. all, like all these things as they become incorporated into a product become subject to to different pressures and different desires. Um, and so the outcomes become, um, 
the design outcomes become more complex. So, um, mm -hmm. so I, I, it's something that I really hope continues to be, you know, part of, of what we explore as, uh, as architects and designers of space and designers of products. Um, yeah. And that's, it's just exciting. It's fascinating. Yeah. Very, very fascinating. So what do you have planned for 2023? Oh my gosh. So much, Ryan. We have, um, we're actually, so, I mean, we're, we're continuing to grow. Um, we grew, uh, uh, 5X in the first year, 10X in the second year. We have another, I think we're growing, you know, two or three X again this year. So we have a lot of, a lot of hiring to do. Um, I mean, of course, uh, you know, germane to this conversation is really that we're also expanding our research and development quite a bit. Um, yeah. So uh, we have um, new products coming online uh, that I'll be excited to talk about in l later this year, or early next year. Um, we're launching our uh, our uh, interior flexible wall product, which uh, mm -hmm. we're calling the Mod Wall at this point. That name will probably change once marketing gets a hold of it i'm not i'm i'm, I'm not a marketer um but but it, that is what it is it is a mod wall uh, my, you know modular wall system um i think that's you know that's really exciting for us this year we're um uh you know the we have some really great partners that we're going into that launch with uh and that is um that's really exciting uh we're uh I mean, really across all categories, we're, we're, uh, you know, adding products and, uh, definitely investing in the research and development that will get us to products in, you know, 2024 and 2025. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, Dan, thank you. It's probably the best, best place to conclude the conversation for now. I, I think there's so much there and I feel like we've just scratched, scratched the surface. I think I'm going to have to come have a visit Please. to the, yes. uh, to the, to the studios yes. and we'll, we'll we'll have another another conversation but really really fascinating so i really appreciate it. thank you yeah thank for you. um taking the time this morning to uh give us a glimpse into into your world so thank you yeah thank you ryan you know i i just appreciate the work uh that, that you do and you know giving uh airtime to these topics as i said it's like it's going to take all of us to you know yeah to to make the design and construction industry what it what it can be and i'm just happy to be a part of that so well, it, well it, it, it you know we're in a really interesting part of time for construction industry you know we've spoken about how construction is you know after agriculture like the least digitized yeah. and advanced uh, industry that that that's happened and now we're starting to see this kind of amazing um kind of like genuine cross-disciplinary businesses emerging and that architecture moving into the world of like not just being construction but also this idea of assembly and the potential of actually having a kit of parts of doing stuff and well actually you as the architect can be part and parcel of the designer who's making these kit, kit of parts and you know the, the kind of proximity that we can um kind of position ourselves to actually you know as a designer and manufacturing things um it's exciting. Yeah. It's very, very exciting. So, brilliant. Thank you so much, Thank Dan. You, Ryan. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment, and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.